white hole, one, two, one, two. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in its history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories. The plain, unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have, for obvious reasons, been changed. The broadcasts are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research for Whitehall 1212 is from Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Now here is the custodian of Scotland Yard's famous Black Museum, Chief Superintendent John Davidson. Good afternoon. Here in the Black Museum, we have murder weapons in quantity and in variety, as no doubt you're aware. Killers are not at all particular about the means they employ in their dreadful pursuits, and whatever comes to hand is often useful. Now this, this has served its purpose. It's an electric torch, as you can see. Its shape makes it an excellent weapon or a violent death. It fits the hand, and when charged with batteries, it's heavy enough to do considerable damage, as this one did, the shape it's in. Well, it had a great deal to do with a man's death, and the man who wielded it died, too. But the torch here didn't cause his death. It was a hangman's knot that struck him under the left ear. Chief Inspector Francis Han can tell you a great deal about it. Can't you, Francis? That I can, John. Chief Inspector Lawrence Campbell Bannerman and I were assigned to this case, which took place in Wimbledon in the early autumn of... Uh, 1937, I'll buy. September 1937. That's right. It was the 16th of September, wasn't it? That's right. Just 15 years ago. Wimbledon, that's right. When we got to the house, we found quite a display. Nice place, wasn't it? Big house. Quite nice indeed. Good, solid construction. Good taste. Well, he's a builder himself, wasn't he? The fellow, wasn't it? The man that was killed. What was his name? Apthorpe. Jeffrey Apthorpe. Big, handsome chap in his late 50s. Dead. Death is Julius Caesar. There with all the family silver laid out about him. He had some nice things. Really fine things. Tableware and a few other things. Mugs. Heavy silver candlesticks. All ready to go. Complete with green baize bag to carry them in. And that battered electric torch on the floor. Alongside his well-battered head. And blood. The revolver shots caught most of the blood. That's right. The revolver was there, too. His own revolver. And the door was locked. We went in. This is what we discovered. Jeffrey Apthorpe's body was lying in one corner of the dining room, which was quite a large one. Two or three chairs had been knocked over. The dining table itself was scarred in several places, as if a heavy body had bumped against it. One or two pictures on the wall were crooked. There were muddy footprints on the carpet, and the heavy buffet stood with its doors open and two of its drawers pulled out and empty. Around the floor stood the Apthorpe silver, carefully arranged in groups, and looking a little like... Uh, like a blasted stove window, wasn't it, Francis? <laughs> Except for the bag, lying in the middle of the display. A green baize bag, very professional appearing, and with half a dozen knives and forks spilling out of it. And some spoons, I remember. As if, uh, as if an experienced burglar had been quietly at work and had suddenly been interrupted. Tell about Apthorpe. Oh, yes, yes. He was lying in a heap, his hands empty, his arms stretched out as if he'd been about to see someone. Burglar, very likely, we thought. The carpet was quite stained with blood, but first it wasn't apparent how he'd been killed. Oh, he was quite dead. When we moved the body, we discovered how he'd been killed. Under him was the battered electric torch, the one Chief Superintendent Davidson showed you. The shockingly battered, stained with blood and... There were marks on his head that seemed roughly to fit the marks on the torch. But that wasn't what killed him. 
There were also two bullet wounds in his head. He'd been shot at close range, and there was a good deal of powder blackening on the body. He'd obviously been shot at close range. But when we looked for the gun, it wasn't there. We found it, though. It was on the floor, just outside the door that led to a hall. A full five feet away from the body. And he had obviously been shot, Francis said, at very close range. The gun had been held, I judge, not more than an inch or two away from him. Tell him about the really strange part there, Francis. Oh, yes, yes. The telephone rang. Kept on ringing while we searched high and low for it. I found it at last. Hello, I said as politely as possible. Hello. Is that the Apthorpe residence? Yes. This is Mr. Apthorpe, sir. Oh, thank you. Now, may I speak to Mrs. Apthorpe, please? Uh, I beg your pardon? May I speak to Mrs. Apthorpe, please? One moment, please. Who do they want? Someone wants to speak to Mrs. Apthorpe. Mrs. Apthorpe? Is there a Mrs. Apthorpe? Must be. They're calling for her, but... Hello? Excuse me just a second, please. What will I do? Hmm? Ask who's calling. Ah, good. Excuse me. May I ask who's calling, please? Who are you? I beg your pardon. I, I'm afraid I'll have to know who's calling Mrs. Apthorpe. Tell her it's Mr. Apthorpe calling. Ah? Huh? I mean, uh, I said... Mr. Apthorpe. Jeffrey Apthorpe. Mrs. Apthorpe's husband. <laughs> Now, it was obviously impossible, wasn't it, for Mr. Jeffrey Apthorpe to be calling his home by telephone. For Mr. Jeffrey Apthorpe lay there before us, most convincingly dead. And if I may quote Algernon Charles Swinburne, dead men rise up never. The Garden of Proserpine stands at twelve. Uh, the Garden of Proserpine and its eleventh stanza. Beg your pardon. The dead men rise up never. Mr. Apthorpe never moved. And the voice on the telephone spoke again. Oh, sorry. Mr. Apthorpe's gone. And broke off the connection. I couldn't agree more that Mr. Apthorpe was gone, and I immediately rang back to see where Mr. Apthorpe might be calling from. Don't keep them in suspense, old boy. It was a sanitarium calling. Now, don't be giving the wrong impression, Lawrence. Not an asylum or anything like that. It developed Mr. A had been... Um, Confined. Had been... Committed. Be still, do. He had been staying in this sanitarium because he was a drinking man. He drank to excess and was going through a course of treatment to remedy or alleviate some of the suffering he had been experiencing. <clears throat> he had been there for several weeks, leaving his wife alone in the great house, and he had been certified as recovered, practically recovered. And he had taken a sudden notion to telephone his wife on a matter of importance and had asked one of the attendants to ring up his home for him. And before the attendant made the call, Mr. Apthorpe had left the place without saying a word to anyone, obviously to return home. Just in time to be killed. That's right. He had told the attendant that it was of the utmost importance that he speak to Mrs. Apthorpe at once. It was obviously of such importance that he, he felt he couldn't wait. But what did he want to tell her? You see, he hadn't told the attendant. His wife couldn't have known. Certainly Mr. Apthorpe couldn't tell us now. The message must have been an important one. But what was it? Obviously, the next step was to consult the lady in question, Mrs. Apthorpe herself. Mrs. Cornelia Apthorpe. She might possibly have some idea of why her husband had attempted to telephone her and then abandoned the effort to return home. Just in time to be murdered. Leaving the body of the deceased to be taken away for an autopsy, Campbell Bannerman and I went looking for her. We had not far to go. She was at the Wimbledon police station in a state of collapse. We found her barely able to speak. I'm sorry I wasn't able to see you, gentlemen. We're sorry, too, Mrs. Apthorpe. It 
a pity we must disturb you, but... I quite understand. Have you discovered anything that I ought to know? I mean... We've discovered nothing yet, except... Nothing. <clears throat> we were hoping that you could tell us something, Mrs. Upthorpe. Yes, we hope... I'm afraid I've said everything, but... Would you mind telling us? This is the first time we've seen you, you know. All we know is what the officers who were first called were able to tell us. If you don't mind, then, Mrs. Upthorpe. Perhaps you know that my husband has been away for some time. He's been ill. Ill? Yes, we know that. I've been away from home, too. Where have you been, madam? Well, only the last few days. I was so lonely in that great house, all alone. Where were you, Mrs. Hatsbaugh? I was visiting friends. But I, but I became worried about our place tonight. The silver and our other valuables, you know, and... I've heard stories about burglars, and so I called a cab and hurried home. I'm sure you can confirm that with the cab people. Where were you, madam? Oh, I was visiting my friends Alice and Eric Shield. And where do they live? Here in Wimbledon. Where, please? Oh, their place is called Portulaca Cottage. It's on Ely Road near the common. Lawrence? Huh? Uh, Alice Shield can tell you she wanted to come with me, but... Oh, wait then, Lauren, please. Right. Uh, uh, how about this Mr. Shield? He can... No, he wasn't at home when I left their house. Oh? Where was he? I don't know. He often worked late. I assume he was working. That's the impression I got from Alice. I mean, I hardly ever saw Eric. No, no, he, he wasn't at home. They know about... I think the people here at the police station telephoned them. Find out, Lawrence, will you, like a good chance? Hmm? Uh, 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 of course. I suppose Eric must have come home just after I left. Probably. He always does come home. Naturally. Uh, you say you didn't know your husband was returning home tonight? No, of course not. He was at the nursing home. I'm telling you. I didn't expect him for another week. And to find him. That is the way you found him. With all the silver there on the floor. He was lying there. Dreadful <laughs> shock, madam. I, um... Why do you suppose he came home? I don't know. I haven't the faintest idea. You had no warning? None, whatever. To find him lying there. <laughs> Did your husband have a revolver? What? A revolver? Yes, he had a revolver. It is possible, then, he was shot with his own revolver. Oh, yes, that is his revolver. Huh? I saw it on the floor. Yeah, he saw it. They telephoned Mr. and Mrs. Shield. I talked to them, too. Oh, good. What else? Well, they talked to Mrs. Shield. Uh, he wasn't home, but he came in while they were talking. What did he say? They were quite shocked. He wanted to come over here to the police station. Oh, no. But, oh, they said he didn't have to. Thank you, Lauren. Sit down. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Aptop, you said you have no idea why your husband came home at this particular time. No, not this slight. Excuse me. Excuse me, Lauren. I was going to ask Mrs. Aptop if she knew any reason why her husband should have put in a telephone call for her telephone before he returned. Call. Well, I didn't know anything about any telephone call. He had put in a telephone call for you before he left the sanitarium. Then he apparently changed his mind and came home instead. How on earth did you... The call was put through whilst we were at your home. After your husband had been killed. Well, I haven't the slightest idea. Had he called you before? From the sanitarium? Hmm? Uh, no. I don't remember that he did. Well, this must have been an important matter. One would think so. Wouldn't one? I can't imagine what it was. Was your husband the worrying type, Mrs. Rattle? No. Well, he must have been worried about something. Well, I don't know what he could be. Do you suppose Mr. Shield might know? Mr. Shield? Oh, Eric, I don't think so. I don't know how he could know. Really? Well, he hardly knew my husband. I've asked Mr. Shield to come over here. Why, he ha... You've asked him to come over here? Yes. You don't mind, friend. Of course not. 
But, uh, I'm afraid I don't quite... Mrs. Epthorpe, what is your theory of your husband's death? Excuse me. Theory? Why he was killed by a burglar, of course. By a burglar? Why, of course. The silver was all laid out, ready to be taken away. Yes. The burglar had broken in, and finding the house unoccupied, had decided to do a thorough job of it. And then my husband came home. You still have no idea why he came home so unexpectedly? I can't think, but... No, I just can't imagine. You were saying, madam? Hmm? Oh, when my husband found the burglar, he started to grapple with him. That's when the burglar struck him with the electric torch. What? Yes, that's what I think, too. I forgot momentarily about the torch. Yes. And then my husband must have broken away and went to get his revolver. He didn't carry the revolver with him? No, no, it was in his desk in a drawer. Go on, please, Mary. Well, then the burglar must have shot him. There was no one there when you arrived? No. Just Jeffrey lying on the floor there. The whole thing must have happened before I got there. Perhaps he heard me and ran away. Slamming the door and locking it. So this thing locked. Yes, I remember. We had a time opening. Well, that must have been the way it happened. Poor old Jeffrey. Don't you think so? Don't you think so? Well, well that's I... the way it looks, isn't it? Well, that's the way it looks to me. Mrs. Apthorpe, you were on good terms with your husband, of course, weren't you? I... Yes? Frankly, Chief Inspector, I was not on the very best of terms with him. Everyone knows we quarreled. My husband drank. My husbands who drink to excess often quarrel with their wives. Well, I didn't want to be under any false pretenses with you. Awesome. You'd find out anyway, but he was my husband. And you loved him? Yes, I loved him. Excuse me. Excuse me. I, uh, I wish I knew why he telephoned you and why he came home so unexpectedly. I'm sure I have no idea. Perhaps someone at the sanitarium might have an idea. Well, perhaps he was bored and just decided to come home. Perhaps he felt he was cured and... and and perhaps he was telephoning me to say that he was coming home. Perhaps. But perhaps he meant... I mean, uh, he might have changed his mind about telling you and decided to surprise you. That might have been it. Mm-hmm. He arrived at a singularly inopportune time. Oh, Jeffrey. Well, at least we'll find the man that killed him, Mrs. Athol. How will you find him? How can you be so sure? There are fingerprints on that electric torch, Mrs. Athol. Oh, I didn't... Are there really? A fingerprint man's been examining it. Oh. How will he know? We'll compare them with the prints in the criminal records office. We've prints of practically every known burglar and... But what if his... The, um... I mean, what if the prints aren't on file? Oh, it'll be a little tougher on us, but... We'll find him eventually. You think you will? We'll find him, Mr. Lepper. Somewhere. Is my husband... I mean, is he still... He's still there. Uh, he's been taken to the mortuary, Mrs. Lepthorpe. Why? Did you wish to go home? If, if he's gone. I mean, would you take me there, please? Uh, we'll have someone take you home, Mrs. Lepthorpe. I was hoping you gentlemen... Oh, I'm so sorry. Should Inspector Hand and I stay here for a while. Uh, we're on duty. Oh, I'm so sorry. Can't be helped, although I will be... We'll be in touch with you, Mrs. Hathorpe, if you'll excuse us now. Come along, Francis. Uh, if you'll just wait here a moment, I'll, uh, we'll send someone to drive you home. Thank you. You have our sympathy, Mrs. Hathorpe. Yes, indeed, Mrs. Hathorpe. Goodbye. Goodbye. What did you... We could have taken her. Why was I so rude, Jimmy? Well... You forget, we must see Mr. Eric Shield, my dear hand. Oh, yes, he's coming here, isn't he? What do you want to see him about? Why couldn't we see him with her? We could. I want to see him alone. Why? He doesn't know anything about all this. He wasn't home, he wasn't there. And that's what we've been told, isn't it? He wasn't at the murdered man's home, was he? You talked to him, didn't you? I asked him to come here. Why, for heaven's sake? I want to ask him a question. And I'd like you to hear his answer. What question? I 
want him to tell us how he knew there was an electric torch involved in this thing, if he'd not been there to see it. This is the last broadcast of Whitehall 1212. We hope that you've enjoyed this series of authentic cases from the official files of Scotland Yard, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper. At the Wimbledon Police Station, Chief Inspector's Hand and Campbell Bannerman of Scotland Yard await the visit of Eric Shield, at whose home the recently bereaved widow has been staying. Chief Inspector Hand speaks. We sat and waited. Campbell Bannerman's sudden revelation was most startling. We stared at each other. But the same thought, I'm sure, was in both our minds. Look here, I said to Campbell Bannerman. She said he wasn't there. That's what he said, too. She said he was at work. That's what he said. How would he know? Uh, excuse me. <clears throat> yes. She take a hand here. Oh, yes. Bernard. Henry Bernard, the pathologist. What's he got to ask? Yes, Henry, yes. He was? You're quite sure? Quite interesting. Quite interesting, indeed. You can swear to that? Ethics. Extremely interesting. Well, thank you. That puts a very interesting and quite different light on it, doesn't it? Keep us advised, will you, old man? Thank you. I'll tell Chief Inspector Campbell Bannerman. He'll be more than interested. <laughs> thank you. Goodbye. But here, Lawrence, that was Henry Bernard. He's... I, uh, I was thinking of something. Huh? What? There are fingerprints on that electric torch, aren't there? Of course, all over the blasted thing. Henry Bernard... I Bunnard, wonder who's there. We'll call the CRO. What if they're not there, Mrs. Apthorpe? Do you suppose... I more than suppose. Don't you? I certainly do. I want this man Shields' print. No way of getting him. Yes, there is. Huh? Wait. Sergeant Murphy, look here. When I press your buzzer, Sergeant, will you please come in here and take the drinking glass I'll indicate to you? It'll be right here on the table. Yes. Yes. And take it down to a fingerprint man. Edward is the son, sir. Good. Take it down and have Sergeant Edward develop any prints he may find on the glass and compare them with the prints on that smashed electric torch we gave him. And then ask him to telephone me here at once. You understand? Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Ah, fancy that will do. Won't be admissible as evidence if we steal his fingerprints. Come in. Oh, uh, excuse me. I was looking for Chief Inspector Campbell Bannerman. I'm Campbell Bannerman. Mm -hmm. I'm Eric Shield. Oh, how do you do? This is Chief Inspector Hand, Mr. Shield. How'd you do? Like to see you. Sit down. Thank you. Well, sorry to inconvenience you. I, I just wanted to ask you a few questions. Of course. You knew Mr. Jeffrey Apthorpe, I believe? Y yes, I knew him slightly. Yeah? And you know Mrs. Apthorpe? Cornelia. Oh, yes, my wife and I know her. You know, she's been stopping at our place for a few days while uh, half has been gone. That's a tragedy, isn't it? Too bad. I hardly knew the fellow. Quite a drunkard, though, I believe. You didn't like him? I hardly knew him. Oh, yes, you, you told us that. Uh, what can I do for you, gentlemen? Well, Mrs. Apthorpe mentioned your name. Like a drink of water? Ah, uh, thank you. Would you like some more? No, yeah, thank you. I'll call Sergeant Murphy. Uh... Get some more water, please, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Have you ever been in Mr. Apthorpe's house, Mr. Sheehan? Uh, no, I haven't. I understand it's quite a place. A burglar broke in there tonight. A burglar killed him. That's what it looked like. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, too bad. I didn't know him very well. That's what you said. 
He was beaten to death. No? Oh? The burglar beat him to death with an electric torch. I thought you said he was shot when you talked to me on the telephone. Shot? With an electric torch. How did you know about the torch, Mr. Shields? Why, you just told me. You mentioned the torch when you talked to me on the telephone. No, I didn't. How could I know anything about it? Have I answered? Yes. <coughs> Chief Inspector. Yes, Murphy. They are identical. Thank you. That's pretty quickly. Wasn't much trouble. Edwards was waiting with the prince from the torch. What's the matter? They compared your fingerprints on the water glass with the ones on the electric torch, Mr. Shield. They're the same. Uh, that's not true. It, 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 it can't be. I, 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 I didn't... I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I'm sorry for my wife. I honestly am, but I love Cornelia. How did you do it? Well, I... I was going away with Cornelia. I was going to get her away from that beast. Marry her? Of course. I loved her, I tell you. Go on. This was our opportunity. He was away, and I went to the house with Cornelia. I took my torch oh. so we wouldn't have to turn on the light. She was picking up her clothes. They were all past. And she talked, too. I just then the door opened. And there was Jeffrey. He'd heard something about Eric and me, and he screamed at us. He'd run away from the sanitarium, and he was drunk. And he said, I'll kill you, I'll kill you both. And he had such dreadful things, and he sprang at Eric. And I lifted my torch. Oh, Eric, it was so horrible. And then you thought you ought to make it look as if a burglar... I took out the silver and arranged it. And then I went away, back home, while calling you, called the police. How did he get shot? I don't know. I didn't. I did it. Cornelia. I knew it had to look like a burglar. And I knew where the revolver was kept. But he was dead, Cornelia. Yes. But I had to make it look good, darling. Eric Shield was tried for murder. And Mrs. Apthorpe with him, of course. They were both found guilty. Shield of murder... Cornelia Apthorpe as accessory to murder. She was hanged at Pentonville two and a half months after the crime. And Mrs. Apthorpe served 11 days of her sentence of penal servitude before she died. Listening to Whitehall 1212, which is based on true stories of Scotland Yard cases. Today's story, The Wimbledon Burglary Murder, is the last of the series. Thank you for listening to us. Heard today were Horace Braham as Chief Inspector Hand and Lester Fletcher as Chief Inspector Campbell Bannerman. Others in the order of their appearance were Harvey Hayes, Morris Dollymore, Kathleen Cordell, Carl Harvard, and Thorine Sears. Whitehall 1212 is written and directed by Willis Cooper. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.